Welcome back and welcome to the second lecture on the Constitution and constitutionalism. And in the first lecture, it, the, the point was pretty basic. It was to distinguish the fact that there is a difference between a constitution, uh, constitutionalism, and democracy. So with a constitution, we're talking about a written document. With uh, constitutionalism, we're talking about the concept of the restraint of political power. Uh, not necessarily a, a democracy, although obviously in the United States we do have a written document we call the Constitution. Uh, we do have the notion that there are restraints uh, on the political power of even the most powerful people uh, in the country, and certainly we saw that with President Nixon uh, and, and Watergate. And this concept of constitutionalism, at least in the English-speaking world, is centuries older than mass-based democracy. So certainly in England, uh, we see constitutionalism uh, formalized with the Magna Carta in the 13th century in 1215. Uh, we don't see mass-based democracy for another 600 years. Now, at the end of the last mini-lecture, uh, I told you that this notion of power sharing between the aristocrats and the king had uh, gone on for centuries. Uh, and then when Queen Elizabeth I died, uh, she left no heir. We get a new group of kings called the Stuarts, who you don't need to know. The Stuarts decided that we're not going to have constitutionalism anymore, that there are not restraints on political power. And their argument was God had placed us on the throne. Uh, and therefore, uh, if we're bad kings, God will punish us in the afterlife if we're good kings, we'll be rewarded in the afterlife. But since God gave us political power, only God can take it away. So this uh, uh, was a, a challenge to what had been centuries of longstanding political tradition. Uh, and the result was uh, civil war. And uh, for me and my family, the civil war is uh, significant. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Henry VIII along with the parliament created a new church, the Anglican Church, the Church of England. Uh, one of my ancestors uh, ends up becoming the Bishop uh, of Bath. Uh, another one of my ancestors becomes the Mayor of Bath. So uh, I'm not the first Randall uh, who has been interested in politics uh, at one time uh, in Southern England where Bath is. Uh, my family was involved in politics. Uh, my family fled uh, England during uh, this uh, English Civil War uh, that occurred, uh, a, a war essentially between the backers of the king who were overwhelmingly Catholic and the backers of the parliament who were overwhelmingly Protestant. So this was both a political struggle as well as kind of a religious war, if you will. Uh, if you want to uh, see where my family eventually ended up permanently, uh, the first real long-standing Randall Homestead is still there. You can go on YouTube and look up, uh, I think it's called Randall's Ordinary, uh, but if you just put Randall's Stonington, Connecticut, uh, that, uh, that Randall Homestead, which goes back to, I believe, 1690. Uh, it still stands and at one time was part of the Underground Railroad. The Randalls were abolitionists who uh, helped uh, run away slaves. And another one of the Randalls was a captain in the War of 1812. So uh, when I first saw that YouTube video, I had tears kind of go down uh, my eyes because I uh, I've never been there. Certainly, I'm planning a Randall road trip to see it. But, you know, when we talk about history, we, we tend to think of history as boring names and dates. And and and, and we all have a history, uh, all of us. And uh, when I, I kind of, uh, on the English side of my family, I've traced my family back to 1422. So uh, I found out that Randall's uh, ancestors of mine uh, were uh, impacted by history. And certainly this English Civil War uh, is important to me uh, because it's how my family got 
to America and why the Randalls left England. For everyone else and for all of us, uh, the significance of this uh, Civil War is it created a new philosophy uh, that you and I have learned. Uh, it's called social contract theory. It has probably uh, never been formally taught to you, but essentially, uh, as I go through these ideas that are listed in your notes, these are things that you and I just take for granted. Uh, they become so politically socialized. So, for example, all the social contract theorists, and I'm just going to talk about a few of them, uh, believe that political power uh, comes from the people, not from God. So, it is people that give government their power and that people create government in order to do certain things for them. Now, the social contract theorists don't agree on why we create government. For example, when I talk about Thomas Hobbes, uh, Hobbes believes that the purpose of government is to provide order and security and to protect people from one another in a society and to protect people from other societies. So, <coughs> excuse me, for Hobbes, people give up freedom in order to be protected. It's a gross oversimplification, but that's essentially the reason for government. Uh, when we get to John Locke, who is Thomas Jefferson's patron saint, and certainly Jefferson's the author of the Declaration of Independence, uh, Jefferson and Locke, tell us that the primary purpose of government are, are to protect people's uh, natural rights, uh, life, liberty, and property, if you're John Locke, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which is what we see uh, in the Declaration of Independence. So uh, even though these two authors that I'm going to talk about quite a bit uh, disagree on why government is formed, uh, and usually they're seen as opposites or opponents, uh, I don't see that at all. I see them as differing chapters in the same book. Uh, both of them, for example, believe that government is created by the mutual consent uh, of the governors, the leaders, and the governed. That would be the people. Both of them believe that there are defects in human nature, and if government did not exist, those deficiencies would be magnified if government did not exist. So it is defects in human nature that create uh, the need uh, for government. Uh, and certainly, uh, I'm a believer in that concept myself. I do believe that with all of the problems we have with government, and I could probably name more of them than any of you, we're still better off with government than without it. And I told you in that very first lecture that, you know, I reject the argument of the anarchist because uh, while I believe that we can have a fundamental disagreement over whether people are primarily good or primarily evil, certainly if you look at the news and if you think about your experiences, we can see that people are capable of unbelievable heroism. You hear stories about people risking their lives for strangers they don't even know, and in some cases sacrificing their lives for people they don't even know. And then you get real inspired about how wonderful uh, we can be, and then you turn right around, and five minutes later, you, you hear about another senseless killing, uh, or robbery, or rape, or whatever it happens to be. So people, in my mind, uh, navigate between these two mountains of good and evil. Uh, there are probably elements of both. And, and whether we are slaves to our gene pool or whether we're products of environment, uh, certainly uh, we're, we're not perfect. And, you know, one of my favorite sayings is by uh, James Madison. It's my second favorite uh, political quote, and I'll give it to you later, but I'll, I'll, I'll use it the first time here. Uh, in explaining the need for a constitution, Madison in the Federalist Papers uh, wrote that if men were angels, no government would be necessary. And I think he's right. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. So whether we're primarily good or primarily evil, we can debate that. 
but certainly were not angels. So during the Civil War, the first political theorist that I have listed in your notes is Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes is an interesting individual. Uh, his primary political value is order, uh, it's security. Uh, he starts off his autobiography by saying, in 1588, the Great Armada sailed from Spain to invade England. When my mother heard of the impending invasion, she went into premature labor where my twin brother Fear and I were born, and we have been forever inseparable ever after. Oh boy, this guy's a character, right? My twin brother Fear and I. So certainly, uh, based just on that very brief quotation, certainly this illustrates Hobbes's notion that the primary political value is order and security. So the greatest evil is insecurity, the greatest good is security. And as your notes point out, during his lifetime, civil wars raged England, and the Thirty Years' War crippled the continent. And the Thirty Years' War is probably the most important a uh, war in Europe that uh, most of my students have never even heard of. Uh, the Thirty Years' War uh, was primarily a religious war fought between Catholic and Protestant princes uh, over what is the true uh, faith. Religious wars are dangerous because they're about values. So, for example, if I were Catholic and you were Protestant, and we're battling over who is practicing the true faith, you can't really negotiate a value, right? It's part of who you are. On the other hand, if we're fighting a war over interests, uh, money, uh, a boundary line on a map, those can be negotiated. Those are very, very negotiable. And, and so the Thirty Years' War lasted from 1618 to 1648, and as you can see, this means that for virtually all of Hobbes's middle age life, from the time he was 30 until 60, these wars ravaged the continent. The wars were so devastating that the population of Europe declined by a third. Now, part of that was from warfare, but part of that was from malnutrition. Part of that were, were from the plague, which certainly is appropriate given the pandemic. Uh, that we're currently going through. But for a man who is obsessed uh, with order and security, you can see that in Hobbes's mind, when you mix religion uh, and you mix politics, a lot of people die. And so Hobbes becomes a very early advocate for the separation of church and state. And even though Hobbes is not a Democrat, he is a believer in a monarchy, this notion of a separation of church and state is something that in America today we take for granted. Second, in your notes, Hobbes takes a utilitarian view of government. Uh, instead of looking at government as seeking social justice, which is what the ancient Greeks believed, that the purpose of government should be to promote the good and justice, Hobbes looks at government as a, a tool, right? We create tools to do jobs for us, a hammer, a screwdriver, etc. Uh, and we don't ask whether the tool is moral or immoral. We ask, is it useful or not? Does the tool perform the job for which they've been created? And so Hobbes looks at government that way, that governments are artificial. They're created by the people to perform certain tasks, just like a hammer and a screwdriver, right? Hobbes believes that the purpose of government is to provide order and security. And, and if the government is able to protect people and provide order and security, they should be very happy and willing to give up a lot of freedom in order to be protected. Now, if the government cannot or will not provide for the safety of the people, then they have the right to create a new government uh, that will. So it's a kind of a notion that we take for granted, that we have created government, that government exists to serve us. That's what Hobbes is saying. The purpose of the government is to serve the people pro by providing order, security, and a rule of law. If they can't do that, the people have the right to create a new government that will. 
And so let me just, just finish this concept up. I'm going to go slightly over 15 minutes, but not much. Uh, even today, there is a battle about what the primary purpose of government is. And to me, when I, you know, talk about conservatives and liberals in America, to me, both of them want government uh, to spend a lot of money to perform certain tasks. Uh, my best friend is very conservative, uh, and my best friend uh, wants government to spend a lot of money on a military to protect us. Uh, I have another good friend who's very liberal and wants government to provide greater equity by providing uh, a larger minimum wage, for example, uh, expanded social security, uh, a health care system uh, for all Americans. Well, both want government to spend a lot of money, but both of them believe that the purpose of government is different. My conservative friend is using Hobbes's argument. I want government uh, to provide security. My liberal friend uh, wants government to provide greater equality. That goes back to those political values that I wanted. So both want government to be large, both want government uh, to spend a lot of money uh, to provide a service to the people. They just disagree on what it should be. In the next mini lecture, I'll come back and finish up uh, Thomas Hobbes.